Um, what I want to stress is the combination of two things we are witnessing at the present time. Uh, both have been stressed by the uh, previous speakers. On the one hand, a level of defeats or severe setbacks for the American empire. And on the other hand, a renewed drive for militarization and solving global problems through military interventions. They, they're going together. They don't learn the lessons of one to stop the other. They're moving on. So soon, you know, in a few years time, Afghanistan, what was that given the way in which historical memory is uh, muted uh, and uh, conveyed on the mainstream media outlets. So let's see. <clears throat> Afghanistan was basically a war of revenge. They had to do something after 9-11. There was a huge debate within the National Security Council. Some members said, forget Afghanistan, let's go for Iraq now i.e. Iraq and dismantling that regime was on the agenda even before 9-11. This was vetoed on the grounds that people wouldn't understand why we've done this when uh, Osama bin Laden and his group are essentially based in Afghanistan. That was the only motivation. We have to have a revenge strike where? And Afghanistan unfortunately for its people won out and a war that had been going on for ages, first against the Russians, then against the Americans, <clears throat> just carried on. And the loss of civilian life in Afghanistan has been the highest uh, uh, in, in proportional global terms for the people of that country. And very little work has been done on building an infrastructure. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan foolishly and stupidly, which some of us oppose, uh, they at least built an infrastructure. They built women's colleges, uh, they had women flying planes. I mean, there was some progress. With this particular intervention by the United States, there's been nothing. So let's not moan now about, oh, what state are we leaving Afghanistan in? You had 20 bloody years to do something and you were incapable of doing it because it clashed with your global perspectives on how to run the world and how to run your own country. That war, as Lindsay correctly pointed out, has failed. Secondly, the war in Yemen, which Obama greenlighted and which was backed and is being backed by Britain, <coughs> has been lost. The Saudis thought they would have quick victories because they had, uh, you know, modern technological armies equipped by the West. They underestimated the Yemeni desire, not just of Shias, Shias, Sunnis, and many, many others who don't belong into, uh, fit into either category, who didn't want to be occupied by the Saudis and the West. And uh, attempts to impose governments in the Yemen failed. Had they not um, upped the ante in 2015. The Yemeni opposition would have won, would have won every city in that country. And they are, I think now, on the verge of doing so. So the West is screaming negotiations, the Yemenis won't negotiate, et cetera, et cetera. The Yemenis are saying, stop the sanctions, let us get food and medicines into the country, and then we're prepared to sit down at the table with you and negotiate your withdrawal from our country. That is what's happening in Yemen. Libya, as we pointed out, remains a total and complete mess, with different factions of Western uh, imperialism, backing different uh, hardcore fundamentalist groups, which in other parts of the world they say they've gone to destroy. The destruction of Libya by the Americans and the British, backed by the EU powers, uh, has left that country a total wreck. And the strategy of the empire and imperialism, the United States in particular, has been effectively to break countries up because they're then easier to rule, like they did in Yugoslavia. And then different European powers went for different parts of Yugoslavia as their protege states. I mean, the EU, the, the, most of the former Yugoslavia consists now of what we can only describe as EU colonies, politically, socially, economically. Uh, 
And that is what imperialism is trying to do globally. They failed in Afghanistan with consequences which we can only imagine. They have failed in the Yemen, they failed in Iraq, and they failed in Syria at huge cost. Huge cost. All these wars could have been sorted out if the desire had been there for negotiated settlements. It hasn't uh, happened. So these wars, I think, if we want to characterize them, these are wars to deprive countries of sovereignty. And to say that the only sovereignty that will be accepted is U.S. sovereignty and that of its uh, satellite states in Western Europe and a few in uh, the Far East. I mean, there is a huge mass movement against the presence of American troops in Okinawa in Japan. But whenever a prime minister comes who vaguely mutters about perhaps the time has come to change, uh, uh, the situation in Japan and foreign bases, an American president flies off to get rid of him. Obama did that to the predecessor of the guy now in power. They just go to remove elected politicians who don't do uh, their bidding. You know, a sort of Jeremy Corbyn type thing, but with people already in power and already on their side. They will not tolerate uh, dissent on uh, this. Uh, Russia, China, it's the same problem that the Russians, whatever you may think of their policies, have asserted their own sovereignty and defended their own national interests. I don't agree with many of the things they do, but they argue that they have the right, as a big power, to do as the Americans do. Why shouldn't they? Who are you to tell us what to do and what not to do when the example you're setting is very clear? And the Chinese at the Alaska summit between the Chinese uh, foreign minister and Blinken gave as good as they got in verbal terms. Certainly they did. I mean, they told the Americans very clearly, China is long past the stage when we listen to homilies delivered by powers who can only talk because of their military superiority. We're not going to do it. We will not cave in to you and your demands and your needs. So in this situation, the US doesn't know what to do. <coughs> They'll try and destabilize China, impose sanctions against China, against Russia. The use of economic sanctions by the United States against countries which do not do their bidding has now reached amazing proportions. Uh, do not underestimate that and could lead to conflicts either directly or indirectly. The war in Azerbaijan, recently over Nagorno-Karabakh, Karabakh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, was a local war backed by local states, but don't have any doubts as what was there in the background, a conflict between the West and Russia in different forms taking place there, just like in the period before the First World War, lots of local conflicts. I'm not saying there will be a Third World War, but the situation being played is dangerous. Britain's role, look, we should you know, not take government reports too seriously, because effectively, Britain is not an independent state. All this nonsense Johnson talked about, once we are out of Europe, we'll be independent. We, some of us criticized that at the time from the left, saying this is total nonsense, because you won't be independent, because you have accepted effectively since the Suez debacle of 1956, you have accepted to be an American satellite state. That is what they used to call old Eastern Europe under the Soviet Union, satellite states. Britain today is a satellite state, a satrapy. Its politics, its military uh, alliances are complete replicas of the United States. They want to increase nuclear spending, or spending on nuclear weapons and their nuclear arsenal, but they will not be allowed to use that without the permission of the State Department and the Pentagon. Have no doubt about that. There is no independence, which is why Corbyn and his sudden emergence pose such a threat and why the state completely freaked out to have a leader of a political party in the House of Commons who wasn't 
a servant of the British security state and beyond that, even more seriously, the United States. So British citizens, supporters of Stop the War have to know what Britain is in order to be able to combat it. It's not Britain alone. It is what it is and the system into which it has happily inserted itself. It needn't have done this, but that is the direction in which they chose to go. And all the major political parties now in parliament have accepted this. And the Scottish National Party in Scotland, while it has many good people in it, has also accepted membership of NATO permanently and various other linked things. Uh, at least there's a debate in Scotland. In England there is no debate uh, apart from us and a few handful of members of parliament. And so Stop the War remains a very crucial organization, the only one of its kind in the rest of Europe and North America. And I'm very proud of that, that those of us who set it up and have remained active and the new younger generations who have come in and joined the movement, even big or small, and it varies, uh, but its importance shouldn't be doubted. It is a thorn in the side of the British establishment, which is all sorts of slanders or apply. You oppose a war and you're a stooge of the government in power, which is being victimized. That's complete nonsense. They couldn't do that in Iraq because the opposition to Blair's war was too strong. They've succeeded to a certain extent in Syria uh, playing on the confusions and demoralizations of certain people on the left, some of whom, I hate to say this, would be very happy for an imperialist takeover of Damascus and a pro-Western government. They think that'll be the road forward. Listen to the bells tolling in Kabul. Listen to that. All these arguments were used against uh, uh, in among by those who supported the war in Afghanistan. All of them were used. We opposed them. So we opposed them in Afghanistan. We opposed them in Syria. We opposed them in Yemen. And we opposed them in all the countries that are occupied. But in order to carry on opposing them, it is extremely important that we carry on recruiting to our own ranks, because soon stop the war and its allied organizations, the way it's going, will be the only real opposition in this country, unless Corbyn launches peace and freedom as an independent organization, not just online, and takes on the Labour Party leadership, because without doing that, he might no longer be an MP, which would be a tragedy. That's all. Thanks. Thank you.